Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Now in Job chapter number 38, uh, the Bible reads in verse 1, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. So basically, we started with uh, this big long conversation for the last 30 some chapters of Job going back and forth with his three friends, and then Elihu jumps in and just clouds the issue even further with, with uh, vain words without knowledge. Well now finally God begins to speak in Job 38. And God's going to speak throughout chapters 38, 39, 40, and 41 before we get to the conclusion in chapter 42. Now, you have to understand that when God first starts talking, he's not really talking about the issue at hand with Job and with his three friends. He starts out saying in verse number 4, Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? So this is him speaking unto Job. Whenever he's saying thee and thou, he's just directing this all toward Job. Now, in order to really understand what God's trying to do here, you know, we have to understand how this ends up in chapter 42. Because in chapter 42, God is going to very clearly state that he's angry at the three friends because they did not speak that which was right concerning him as his servant Job had done. And so, when we, when we understand that, we know that in the end, God is going to take Job's side in this controversy. Because remember, the whole book of Job is a battle of words between Job and his three friends. He's saying, I'm innocent. And they're saying, no, you've sinned. Because if you hadn't sinned, all these bad things wouldn't have happened to you. We know from chapters 1 and 2 that Job was a perfect and an upright man that feared God and eschewed evil. And that God was moved against him without cause. God did not punish him for anything that he had done. It's clear that the reason that God allowed Job to lose all his wealth and, and be physically afflicted and so forth was because the devil had come to him and challenged him and so forth. I'm not going to re-preach all that. But that's found very clearly in chapters 1 and 2. So we know from the story here that Job was innocent in the beginning. And we know that there's been this argument going on for 30-some chapters of the three friends and Elihu trying to accuse him of sin and saying that sin is why these bad things are happening to him. And Job saying, I've been living a righteous life. I haven't done anything wrong. Now we know in chapter 42, God's going to take Job's side and say, I'm angry at the three friends. You're right. Or Job spoke right. And make them go and apologize to Job. And then Job has to pray for them so that they don't uh, receive a curse themselves. You say, well, what are all these questions about then? Because chapters 38, 39, 40, and 41 are basically God just asking all these questions that are just basically telling Job how much greater he is than Job. So it's funny, when you start reading in chapter 38, it almost seems like God's coming down on Job. Because he's asking him these really adversarial questions in chapters 38, 39... 40, 41. It seems like he's coming down hard on Job, but that's not really what he's doing. Because we know in chapter 42 that he's going to take Job's side. But, and I just want to give you this real quick overview before we get into chapter 38. Because I want you to understand why God's saying the things that he's saying in chapter 38. It's because of the fact that Job is going to be very exalted in chapter 42. The Bible tells us he's going to get double the wealth that he had lost. He's going to be even greater. He's going to have even more wealth. Not only that, but God's going to personally put his stamp of approval on Job and rebuke the three friends who have attacked him. And I think what God's doing in chapters 38 through 41 is he first wants to make sure that Job is humble enough to receive that exaltation that he's going to receive in chapter 42. You know, the Bible says before honor comes humility. And what we have to understand is that no matter how great a man is, like Job, for example, who the Bible tells us was the greatest man living at that time, no matter how great a man is, God is still far, far greater. And no man has the right to be puffed up before God or, or to be high-minded or prideful. And, you know, I don't believe that Job has been prideful. Because we see that Job is instantly humble when God talks to him. And I think Job's been humble throughout the book of Job. 
That's not the point. But because God is going to exalt him very greatly in chapter 42 and praise him before man and give him double the wealth, he has to make sure that Job understands his place in the world and that Job's not going to get high minded. I think God's just preemptively making sure that Job is going to be humble before he gives him a big blessing. And that's what God does a lot in our lives. First, he'll often have to humble us before we're ready to really be blessed by him. Because if God were to just give us a lot of wealth, and maybe we're not ready for it, it could destroy us. The Bible says the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. And so, sometimes God will put us through hard times and humble us and and put us through things before we're about to be really exalted or before he's really going to prosper us just to make sure that it doesn't go to our head or destroy us. Because remember what God said about John the Baptist. He said that among them that were born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Now that's a pretty big compliment to say he's the greatest man. Just like Job was the greatest man at this time, John the Baptist was the greatest man at that time. And he said, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So we still have to understand that no matter how great a human being is, they're still a human being. And they should not be exalted above measure. And so when God is proclaiming his own greatness for the next four chapters, and telling Job, look, compared to me, you're nothing. That's what he's doing. He's just showing Job that Job needs to be humble. This is not an attack on Job. This is not God telling Job, you've been living a sinful life. That's why I came down on you. Which is what the four other people in this book have been saying. They're wrong. This is just God humbling Job because all of us need to be humble. Say, well, you know, why do I need to be humbled? I'm living a good, well, Job was living a great life, but he still needed to be humbled. Because God is so much greater than any of us, we always need to keep that in perspective. So that's why he's asking him all these things. You know, can you do this? Can you do that? Were you there when I did this? Job never claimed to be able to do any of those things. But this is just God humbling him and just telling him how much greater he is than Job is. So it says in verse 3, Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it broke forth as if it had issued out of the womb? Now of course Job is not going to answer any of these questions. He's not able to answer any of these questions. He asks him all kinds of questions about animals and about science and about you know where he was when various things happened. Job doesn't know the answer to any of these questions. Job is unable to answer. And that's the whole point of asking these questions is to show Job the difference between God's greatness and himself. That even the greatest man, and listen to this, this is the greatest man on the earth and God's putting him down and saying, I'm greater than you. I'm much greater. I know much more than you. I have much more power than you ever do. So how much more should we be humble? I mean, who here thinks that you're the greatest person living at this time? You know, uh, I see a few hands up. Well, no, I'm just kidding. No, I don't. But anyway, n- none of us would even deign to even think that we could come close to being in that category like Job is of being the greatest of all God's servants at that time. So if the greatest of all God's servants is counted as nothing before him, then that should put us in a place where we're humble and where we realize our place and that we would not speak against God. Now let's examine some of the things that are here. There's one verse that I really want to focus in on because there's a verse in this chapter that's used to teach a lot of false doctrine. And so I want to focus in on that verse a little bit. Because it says in uh, verse number 4, Where was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? And so forth. But when it gets to verse 6, it says, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So in this scripture he says that when the cornerstone was laid, that the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now a lot of people use this scripture as their proof text, as their only proof text in the whole Bible to prove that the sons of God are angels. Now here's the problem with that doctrine. This book has 1,189 chapters in it. And a 
it talks a lot about the sons of God, and it talks a lot about angels, and guess what it never says in any chapter in this whole book? The sons of God are angels. And here's the thing, and go to Hebrews chapter 1, and I'm going to go into this in depth right now, but go to Hebrews chapter 1, because all false doctrine is always based on something other than a clear scripture from the Bible. You know, true doctrine is based on a clear Bible statement that doesn't beat around the bush, it just comes right out and says it. It just tells you. I mean, think about all the doctrines that we believe are based on a clear Bible verse. You know, if you think about the virgin birth, you could point to a clear verse. You know, behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall bring forth a son. You know, you could point to a clear verse on the Trinity. Three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. You know, clear verse on the deity of Christ. God was manifest in the flesh. Unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Clear scripture defeating evolution. You know, that everything brings forth after its own kind. That in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, or heaven and the earth, and that he created all animals after their own kind. And and male and female and so forth. You know, any doctrine that you want to name, any doctrine you want to throw at me, you know, the the post-tribulation rapture, How about immediately after the tribulation of those days? You know? Jesus Christ comes in the clouds, the trumpet sounds, etc. You know, Matthew 24, 29 through 31. Anything we believe needs to be based on a clear scripture. Now, whenever somebody has a false doctrine, it will not be based on a clear scripture. There will never be a verse that just comes right out and says it. What it will be is a lot of explanations and logic. Because let me explain to you. A book this long with this many pages and this many words in it, 31,000 verses, you can take things out of context and make this book support whatever you want. Like, whatever false doctrine you make up, you can find a verse to support it in this book. Now, notice, I'm not saying you can find a verse that will come right out and say it, or teach it, but you'll find a verse to support it. Think of the craziest, weirdest doctrines of the Catholics, or the Mormons, or of whoever. They will find a verse in this book to prop it up. But the verse will never be a clear statement. It will always be something that they have to explain or some way to support it. See, you can support false doctrine from the Bible, but the Bible will never teach false doctrine. It will never state false doctrine. You know, for example, just to name some really weird beliefs that people have. For example, the Mormons go and get baptized for dead people. They go and search out their genealogy and get the names of all their dead relatives. You know, uh, and then they will go and get baptized in the name of that person. Okay. And did you know that there's actually a verse in the Bible that they use to support that? Now, do you think that there's a verse that comes out and says, Hey, we need to go and get baptized for dead people? No. Go ye therefore into all the world and get baptized in the name of dead relatives? There's no verse like that. But here's the thing. There is a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that they use... To, to teach that, okay? And, and listen to it. It's in verse 29. You'll have to turn there, but it says, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? Now, right there, he's just asking a question. So people who are baptized for the dead, why do they do that? <laughs> but they'll take that verse and say, see, we're supposed to be doing this. Even though there's no command like it. But you see, if you take a verse out of the context of what he's explaining, he's explaining the contradiction in people's belief where they're saying there's no resurrection and then they're getting baptized. For th- that doesn't make any sense. He's not saying, let's be like them and let's go get baptized. You can support polygamy from the Bible, but there's no command for polygamy. There's no place where God says polygamy is fine. Polygamy is not a sin. There's nothing like it. You'll just find verses that will support it. And you can support any false doctrine. I got a pamphlet in the mail from the Catholics. And they supported every Catholic doctrine from the Bible. From infant baptism. They supported worshiping Mary. They, everything that they believe can be supported from the Bible. But you know what? The Bible never states their doctrine. So does everybody understand the difference? Whenever you believe something that's clearly stated in Scripture, you know it's true. Because it's just a clear statement. But whenever you believe doctrine that has to be explained by man's logic, and then, well, there's a verse to support it. 
You know, lots of verses to support the pre-trib rapture, but nobody can point you to one verse that says, hey, the rapture comes before the tribulation. We have a verse that says after the tribulation. They don't have one that says before the tribulation. They have to have a lot of supporting verses. You know, And that's the way it is with all false doctrine. And this doctrine is no exception. There is no clear scripture in the Bible that states anywhere that the sons of God are angels. Now people that teach that when the Bible says sons of God, that means angels, here's what they basically have to do then. They have to just basically just look at a lot of verses and just say, well, if this is this, well then this is this. And then they, they come up with logic based on scripture. But look at Hebrews 1 verse 5. Look at Hebrews 1, 5. I'm going to show you just a clear statement here. Okay, in verses 5 and 6. It says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son, and again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. So in verse 5, I want to just break this down to you very carefully. God is saying here that unto Jesus Christ the statement was made Thou art my son this day have I begotten thee. Right. And unto Jesus Christ the statement was made I will be to him a father and he will be to me a son. Yep. And that that statement was never made unto any of the angels. Either of those statements. Because it says in verse 5 For unto which of the angels said he at any time Thou art my son. Well, let's get verse 4 just to get the context. It says, being made so much better than the angels. Why is he better than the angels? Let's find out. Being made so much better than the angels, as he had by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now, if God is saying here that he never said unto the angels at any time, I'll be to you a father. You'll be to me a son. Then how can, how can they say, oh, the Old Testament when it says sons of God, that's angels. How could God get up and say, I never said unto the angels at any time, you're my son, but the sons of God, those are angels. How do you say that? How do you do that? It doesn't make any sense. Now, I've heard people say, well, but this has a capital S. Okay, let me explain something. When you talk, capital letters don't come out of your mouth. <laughs> because it says, which of the angels said he... At any time. Thou art my son. Right, yeah. <laughs> you don't talk in capital letters. That's why it's... It, it, let me explain something else to you. Yeah. If any doctrine that you believe in the Bible is based on the use of capital letters, time to rethink that doctrine. Because you know what? The Word of God it was spoken before it was written. And it should, be, it should be true when you speak it and when you write it. Now, if there's a verse that's only true when you write it, because if you write it and you use a capital letter, it's true. That he never said that a capital S. And, you know, but when you say it, it's no longer true because he did call them a son. See, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Especially when you keep in mind that capital letters are a new invention. You know, and back, when the, back when the Bible was written, it was all written in the same, you know, uppercase. Like it was written either all in uppercase or all in lowercase in the Greek manuscripts. So, you know, this whole thing of, of, a, of a letter being capitalized is in a modern English Bible. But you know what? When you say things, capital letters don't come out of your mouth. And this very clearly says that he never said to any, well, some of the angels. No, unto any of the angels at any time, he never said, I'll be to him a father and he'll be to me a son. Now, you say, well, this is just different because it's just referring to the fact that, you know, he's the son of God. But wait a minute, the Bible says we're all sons of God as humans. But he didn't say that to the angels. Now, look, if you would, at uh, 1 John chapter 3. See, my doctrine is based on clear scripture. Here's a clear scripture for you on who the sons of God are according to scripture in 1 John chapter 3 verse 1. This is a clear verse from the Bible. Not somebody's interpretation or logic or what they justify. It says in verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when, we, when he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. 
Now the Bible talks about being a son of God and it relates that to being like him. Now my son is like me. My son is in my own image. When we are God's sons, the Bible teaches that we're one day going to be conformed unto his image. We're going to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. The Bible calls Jesus Christ the firstborn among many brethren. And the Bible says that we have been begotten again unto a lively hope. Okay, the Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So we have all this clear scripture where the Bible says that a human being who believes on Jesus Christ becomes a son of God. Where the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the firstborn among many brethren. Then notice in Hebrews 1, he said that Jesus had obtained, by reason of inheritance, he had obtained a better name than the angels, for unto which the angels said, He at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Well, the Bible says that if we are the sons of God, according to Romans 8, it says, If sons, then we're also heirs. Joint heirs with Jesus. Okay? So, Jesus Christ received a greater inheritance than the angels because He's the Son of God. And because we are sons of God, we're going to receive an inheritance as well. As sons. We're going to be joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Now, are fallen angels joint heirs with Jesus? Because the Bible says clearly in Romans 8 that if you're a son, you're a joint heir with Jesus. And he said, I never said unto the angels at any time that I'll be to him a father and he'll be to me a son. So again, clear scripture is stating that the sons of God are people that are saved. Lots of clear verses. And then this doctrine that uh, says that the sons of God is referring to angels is refuted by a clear scripture in Hebrews 1 that just says, I never said that at any time. Yep. Oh, but you said it back in Genesis 6. No, I never said it at any time. Oh, but you said it in Job 38. Oh, no, I never said it at any time. Now, go back to Genesis 6, if you would, and let's look at Genesis 6. And we're going to go through each of these points. Yeah, well, okay, well, let's go to Job 1.6 then. And then we'll go to Genesis 6. No problem. In Job 1.6, okay, I was going to get there, but let's go there right now then. Job 1.6 says... Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. Now here's the thing. It doesn't say that Satan is a son of God there. It says Satan came also among them. Meaning that in addition to the sons of God who are there presenting themselves before the Lord, Satan also shows up and presents himself before the Lord. But that does not make him a son of God. Now this is at God's throne in heaven... Where saved Christians who are in heaven are standing before God and presenting themselves before the Lord. Amen. Because there are millions of people in heaven yep. and there were millions of people in heaven at this time. Yep. Right. So there you go. These are all, it's always saved Christians every single time. And I'll come back to Job 1.6. But look at Genesis chapter 6. It says in Genesis chapter 6, and basically those who teach this doctrine, they're going to, you know, they get it from Genesis 6. And then they try to back it up with the verses from Job that we're going to deal with in chapter 38. But it says in Genesis 6 verse 1, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in 120 years. Now I'm going to go through every verse here. But let me start out by just pointing this out right away. Okay. Notice that when the sons of God, it, they're saying it's angels. I'm saying it's people that are saved. It's believers. Well, how, oh, you say there were believers back then? Well, look at chapter 4, right. verse 26. It says, And to Seth, to him also there were born, uh, was born a son, and he called his name Eos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. So people who have called upon the name of the Lord are saved. They are the children of God. They are the sons of God. Now it says in Genesis 6.1, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born on them, that the sons of God, I say that that's believers. I say that that's saved men. Human beings. It says, Sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit... And look, verse 3 just nails it. 
My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Now how can you say that these sons of God are something other than man, something other than flesh, when who does God get angry at? When the sons of God are going in unto the daughters of men, who does he get angry at? Man. He says, I'm not going to strive with man. He's flesh. He's human, okay? So that's who God's angry at. Why isn't he saying, well, I, I'm, I'm angry at the angels. And they're not flesh. They're of another flesh. They're not man. See what I'm saying? Now look what it says in verse 4. It, it, it says, yet his days shall be 120 years. Look at verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, let me point this out in verse 4. This verse is often misquoted and twisted. Here's how people will quote this verse. They'll say, well, the Bible says that when the sons of God went in unto the daughters of men, they produced giants as a result of that union. That is the exact opposite of what this verse says. Because the verse says at the beginning of verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God went in, came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were bold men of renown. So which came first? The giants... Or the union of the sons of God with the daughters of men. The, the Bible is crystal clear that there were already giants in the earth. And then also after that, when the sons of God went into the daughters of men, they produced children that were mighty men and men of renown. Leaders, great men, and it's a warriors, powerful men. I mean, you know, strong men, whatever you want to say. And then it says... God saw that the wickedness of man was great. Why isn't he saying, I saw the wickedness of the angels was great? He says he saw the wickedness of man was great, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. Why isn't he upset that he made the angels? If that's who the problem is. And he said it grieved him at his heart, and the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowl of the air. For it repented me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Notice that. The earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. Why, God? Why has the end of all flesh come before you? Why are you going to destroy the whole earth? For, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Through who? Man. He says it's through violence through them. And behold, I'll destroy them with the earth. Now, this is what people will teach. They'll say, no, 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 here's what happened, Pastor Anderson. The, the fallen angels and demons came down from heaven and mated with human beings and produced half angel, half human hybrids with two to three sets of teeth that were 30, 40 feet tall. Some said 450 feet tall. That's what the book of Enoch says. It says 150 cubits, which is 450 feet tall. I mean, have you ever looked at a building that's 450 feet high? Yeah, that's a pretty big building. But anyway, I, my son calculated the size of the eyeball of someone who was 450 feet tall. How big is it, son? Yeah, 15 foot nose, 3 foot eyeball. Okay, and this is what they teach. That because the reason that God, here's what they say. The reason God flooded the earth was to wipe out all these genetic hybrids that were half human, half angelic, beast-like creature. And, and that, you know, Noah, Noah found grace. He was like the only pure human left. So they get this sci-fi warped interpretation. And then let me explain something to you, by the way. You know, when I, I haven't seen this new Noah movie. I'm not going to watch it. Amen. But I know that it is heavily based on the book of Enoch. Which, by the way, the book of Enoch is a book that was buried in the earth until 1948. You know, just coincidentally, yeah. coincidentally, when, the, when the, the, the satanic fraud of a nation of Israel was founded, the Antichrist nation of Israel, 
that, that uh, denies that Jesus is the Messiah? Okay? The, the, the anti-Jesus Christ fake that every Christian loves to support and worship, Nation of Israel, was founded in the same year. They just happened to find that same year all of these documents to prove the King James Bible wrong and to go into all the new versions like the NIV. And they found all these wonderful documents of the book of Enoch that we'd lost for all these years to teach us about all these angel human hybrids and aliens and, and, and mysticism and Kabbalah and seventh heaven and all this garbage. It's all coming from, you know, this book of Enoch, Dead Sea Scrolls, whatever, all that, those findings that they just happened to find in 1948. But I'm sure that's a coincidence. The devil has certain years that he's really busy. 1830 was one that was huge for him. You know, 1948 was another one. You know, where he really works overtime. But let me say this. Okay, if you read this passage, if you take this passage for face value, there's no mention of genetic mixing, of hybrid beasts that are part animal, part human. And you say, well, what do you mean animal? The Bible is clear about these angelic beatings, the cherubims and the seraphims. They are known as beasts. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they're called, my friend. And a beast and a human cannot produce offspring. So when we talk about the word angel in the Bible, sometimes the Bible will use the word angel in a really loose sense, like just a messenger, where anybody could be an angel, you know, where you, like figuratively speaking. Like if I, if I, you know, said that my child looked like an angel or Stephen had the face of an angel or, or just, you know, somebody is being sent as an angel or, or as a messenger. But when we talk about what we think of as angels being the winged creature, right? The non, what, I'm talking about a non-human here. Right. Like the cherubims and the cherubims. The Bible calls them beasts repeatedly. Yeah. Yeah, many Look at Revelation. It calls, all you have to do is study Ezekiel 1 and 10. It calls them the living creatures. And it talks about the four wings. And it talks about the four faces. And, and it describes what the cherubims look like. You go to Revelation and they're called the four beasts. It's the same exact creature that Ezekiel saw in the book of Ezekiel. So, when you look at this passage, you don't see anything like that. What you see is sons of God intermarrying with the daughters of men meaning saved Christians intermarrying with the ungodly, then the whole earth becomes ungodly. The whole earth is filled with violence. And God's real clear, the reason he's destroying it is not to clean up the gene pool. It's actually to uh, wipe out man because of his violence and his evil imagination. Now, let me just prove to you what the Bible means when it says giant. Okay, let's figure that out. Because there are a couple of giants mentioned in the Bible where it gives us their exact height. Now, nothing in the Bible is incidental, coincidental, and accidental. If God gives us approximate heights for two giants, why would I believe that there's some other giant that has some completely different height? If God gives us a couple of heights. Okay. So let's look at some heights of giants. First of all, go to 2 Samuel chapter 21. 2 Samuel chapter number 21. Because in 2 Samuel 21, we will get you know, uh, an understanding of these giants. Now, now, here's the funny thing. The Bible talks about giants all throughout the Old Testament. So if the whole point of the flood was to wipe out these giants, why were they around after the flood? I mean, it doesn't make any sense, my friend. Oh yeah, God's going to flood the old earth and wipe it out to get rid of these angelic, half-human, half-beast, whatever they want to call it, hybrid giants. Why are there still giants then after the flood? Well, one of them snuck on the ark. You know, one of Noah's son's wives was actually part giant or something. You know, it just crept in. Look, if God, what, what, God, oh, whoops, I just wiped out the whole earth for no reason. Because we just let on the same thing. I mean, it doesn't even make sense. What God did after Noah gets off the ark is he institutes the death penalty. To, to stop the earth from becoming full of violence once again. Okay, to prevent the same thing from happening again. That's why when Noah gets off the earth, he institutes the death penalty immediately in chapter 9. He says, you know, whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Okay, so the, the idea of the fact that it was to wipe out these giants doesn't make any sense. Now, first of all, let's get a feel for how tall these giants are, what the Bible calls giants. Look at 2 Samuel 21.15. The Bible reads, Moreover, the Philistines had yet war with, again with Israel, 
And David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines and David waxed faint. And Ishbi Benob, watch this, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword thought to have slain David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, succored him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibachai the Hushathite slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Jer Oregim, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was yet a battle in Gath, where there was a man of great stature, that had on every hand six fingers, and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number, and he also was born to the giant. And when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimea, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Now, this passage does not give us the exact height of any of the giants. But here's the thing. It says that they were all born unto one man, doesn't it? It says they were all the sons of the giant. And notice how there are four of them and one of them is the brother of Goliath. Well, if, if they're all four brothers and one of them is the brother of Goliath, you know what that means? They're all the brethren of Goliath, right? Now remember when David went to fight Goliath, what did he put in his bag? How many stones? Five. He took five smooth stones. Why did David take five smooth stones? He only used one. But the four brothers. So he had five stones because there are five giants. Now he only ended up slaying the one, but he must have known that there were the other four brothers are there, so he brings five stones. So these are the four, according to the Bible, the Bible clearly tells us that these four men were giants, and it talks about their, their spears and their equipment. Go back to 1 Samuel 17, because the equipment that these giants have is the same size of equipment that Goliath had. And God's telling us, oh man, these guys are huge, here's how much their equipment weighed, Here's how big their spear was. Goliath has all the same gear. Why? Because he's from the same family. Why? Because Goliath is their brother. Why? Because Goliath was a giant. He was of the sons of the giant. Now look at the, the size of Goliath is given in 1 Samuel 17. It says in verse 4, And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. So the Bible gives us Goliath's exact height. Now a cubit is the distance between a man's middle finger to the bottom of his elbow. Okay? So this is approximately 18 inches. So if the Bible says that Goliath is six cubits and a span, six cubits times a foot and a half, because a cubit is about a foot and a half, okay, that would be approximately nine feet. Okay? Then the span is the distance from the finger to the thumb, and it's considered to be about half a cubit, about nine inches. So we're talking about a guy who is nine feet and nine inches tall, approximately. So when the Bible calls Goliath and his brethren giants, they are nine feet and nine inches tall. Not 30 feet tall, not 450 feet tall, but nine foot nine inches tall. Now go to Deut Deuteronomy chapter 3 verse 11. Because you know let every word be established by two witnesses. You know if one Bible verse is not enough let me give you two. They give you an approximate dimension. Now we've established that Goliath was nine foot nine inches tall by modern measurements. Now let's look at another giant Og the king of Bashan. Look at verse 11. It says, for only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. Now, now let me say this. That's talking about in that tribe, in that area. Because there were actually giants in all the different nations of the Canaanites. But when it says, Og only remained, it means of those particular giants of the Amorites. Because it talks about other giants later and what areas of the world they were in. But it says... Only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. 
Not after his cubit, but after the cubit of just a basic man. The Bible used that term all the time. The cubit of a man, meaning just the average, typical cubit that a man has, which is 18 inches. So this guy's bed, now this doesn't mean that's how tall he was, but his bed was 13 and a half feet by 6 feet. Okay, so picture a bed that's 13 and a half feet by 6 feet. That means that he must have been shorter than 13 and a half feet. Now we don't know his exact height. But we know that he didn't go to bed at night in the fetal position because he had a special bed made and it still wasn't big enough for him. If you're going to have a special bed made, you're going to make sure it's big enough for you to stretch out like this. Okay? Because you don't, do you go to bed at night and your head is just pressed against the headboard and your feet are pressed against the footboard and you're just jammed in there? No. Obviously, you have some room to stretch out a little bit. So they're saying, like, wow, this is a cool artifact. I mean, think about it. It'd be a pretty cool souvenir to have this guy's bed. You know, you can picture going through a museum and seeing a bed that's 13 and a half feet long. Say, hey, this was this guy's bed. Now, it doesn't mean that he's 13 and a half feet tall, but he could be any height up to 13 and a half feet, right? But he couldn't be, long, he couldn't be taller than that. So let's say if he was about 11 or 12 feet. You know, I'll give you 13 if you want to. If you want to say that he couldn't even stretch his arms above his head, fine. But if he actually could just go like this in the bed, okay? Look at look at how much of my arm is above my head. Somebody call out to me how how much that distance is. About a foot and a half, the cubit of a man. Yeah. Okay, so about a foot and a half, right? And I'm six foot tall. Okay, so that's like a quarter of my height, right? So if I'm six feet up to here, here's like another 25%. So if you subtracted that amount from the 13 and a half, that would probably get you in the ballpark of how tall this guy was because I'm assuming he slept in a bed where he could at least stretch his arms. So that would make mean he's 11 feet. But you know, if you want to believe that he was 13 feet 5 inches, fine. That's still not 30. That's still not 450. Okay? I say he was probably about 11 feet tall, just using simple logic of based on the size of his bed. And then you look at Goliath, he's 9 foot 9. Now here's the thing about that. The tallest man living on the earth right now, right now, today, he was born, I think, in the early 80s, and he's 8 foot 3 inches tall. He's a farmer or something, I read up on him a little bit. But he's like 8 foot 3 inches tall. Now that's not super different than a guy being 9 foot 9 inches, is it? I mean, it's not that different. And that's a guy that's living today. But here's the thing. Archaeologists have dug up bones of people that were 9 to 11 feet tall. You know, they'll measure their femur and everything and figure out, okay, based on the length of the femur, based on the length of the bones, this guy was 9 and a half feet tall. This guy was 11. So here's the thing. In the Bible, we have evidence... I mean, this is actually what the Bible says. Well, but I just think that the other giants used to be taller. Yeah, but you're not getting that from the Bible because the Bible only gives us two measurements. Yeah, yeah. What about the, uh, the two spies, Caleb and... Uh, uh, There's no measurement given. Joshua, when they said that they looked like small grasshoppers. Like okay, so, 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 okay, so that, that's what some people will bring up. That, oh yeah, when they went into the, the promised land, they felt that they looked like grasshoppers before them. Okay, here's the thing. That's a figure of speech. That's an expression. Man, we were like grasshoppers in their sight. They're so big. I mean, if you expect, I mean, think about a grasshopper is like two inches long max. A grasshopper is like an inch or an inch and a half long. Okay, so that would mean that they'd be 70 times taller than us if we're going to take that literally. That would be a 450, uh, 450 foot guy. Basically taller than any building in Phoenix. Look at the Phoenix skyline. That's how tall they were with a, a 12 foot nose and a 3 foot eyeball. I don't believe in it. It's garbage. That's what the book of Enoch says. But I believe the Bible. I don't believe the book of Enoch. And the Bible says a giant. Here's the thing. If there really was a guy who was 450 feet tall that was called a giant, then God wouldn't call a 9 foot guy a giant. He'd just call him a tall guy. Because, I mean, look. Which one? Think about it. A 9 foot 9 guy. Is he closer to my height or closer to the 450 foot guy? Yeah, so why would you call him a giant? Why would you just call him like a tall guy? Okay, because he's called a giant because that's as big as people get. 
Nine, and here's the thing. Archaeologists have dug up bones all over the world and dug up bone after bone after bone. And all they found, the tallest one that they found, I believe it was in France, they found a bone of a guy that they said he's like 11 feet tall. And some people even disputed it and said, you know, he might have been more like 10 foot 10 or something. You know what I mean? So, but, but it was approximately in the ballpark of an 11 foot guy. You know, we don't have his exact height. But there are a lot of bones found of people that were 9 to 10 feet tall. Many bones like that. Okay, now here's the thing though. So in the whole history of mankind, we've never found a bone of anybody more than 11 feet tall in the history of, of archaeology and searching and digging things up. We never find one in the Bible that's taller than that. Why would we believe in it when it's not in the Bible and we've never seen the bone? Now, people will constantly email me and message me and send me pictures of all these skulls and femurs of people that are 25, 30 feet tall. They're all internet hoaxes. They're all photoshopped. And you can go to websites where they show you the original picture. Yep. They'll show you, this is the original picture. This is how they photoshopped it, but people just believe in it. Yeah. Exactly. And they say, oh yeah, they found a 30-foot guy. But Pastor Asher, they found a 30-foot guy. You, no, you cannot, you'll never find any science book, any history book, any real photograph that hasn't been debunked. Well, you know, let, let's also, there's a lot, you know, we can show you pictures of, of uh, all kinds of things. You know, I mean, if you like those pictures of the 30-foot bones they found, you're going to love the Weekly World News. I'll buy you a subscription to it. <laughs> Maybe we can get you a subscription to the National Enquirer and the Weekly World News while we're at it, where there was a bat boy that was found in a cave. There was a 160-pound baby that was found. Right. You know, if that's the kind of garbage that you're going to base what you believe on just internet hoaxes. I mean, look, it's just a giant skull and they show a tiny guy and it's been proven to be photoshopped, but people just keep sending it to you. There's the evidence! It's right there! Can't you see it? <laughs> no, there's no evidence of this stuff. So what I'm saying is the people who promote this stuff have, have brazenly lied and fabricated evidence through Photoshop. It's been proven. You can look at the evidence. Okay, Hollywood promotes it. You know, when Hollywood's promoting your doctrine, you think that you would take a second and stop and think. Like, like with the new Left Behind movie coming out. Yeah, I think the devil just really wants Hollywood to prepare people for the rapture. That's why he's putting out this Left Behind movie. Look, when Hollywood is preaching your doctrine, you should stop and, and, and question it. And the book, the, this new Noah movie is all based off the book of Enoch. It's based off this, you know, fallen angels are, are sons of God and so forth. Now, stop and think about what you're saying when you say that the sons of God are angels. Okay, because these angels, according to the people who teach this doctrine, are, are the sons of God in Genesis 6. Well, here's the thing. If we're in Genesis chapter 6... No, it's just it's people that are saved marrying people that are unsaved. Because the people that are not saved are not sons of God. So where did they fall from? It doesn't say that they fell. No, it doesn't. It doesn't say fell. All it says is that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. It doesn't say they came down from heaven. It doesn't say that they fell. It doesn't say anything like that. It just says sons of God. Well, look at verse 1 of chapter 6. Where did I have you turn? Did I have you turn somewhere else? Are we still in chapter 6? Chapter, chapter 6 verse 1 it says, King Pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born of them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. So there's no falling, there's no coming down from heaven or anything like that. Just sons of God marrying the daughters of men. Does it say, hey, they just slept with them? No. Because that's how people will quote this too. They'll be like, oh yeah, the, the sons of God came down and fornicated with or slept with the humans and created giants. That's not what it says. There's no fornication mentioned here. It says they took wives. And the Bible says that the angels neither marry nor are given in marriage. And the Bible also says that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And the Bible says that the angels are, are, are spirits. 
And Jesus said, a spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me to have. So if a spirit has not flesh and bone, the angels are ministering spirits, the cherubims and the seraphims are beasts, they're spirits, okay, whose dwelling is not with flesh. I mean, look at the fallen angels, the demons, they possess people. They're not flesh. They come, they're a spirit that comes into the body and, and controls their flesh but when they're demon-possessed. So there's no falling, no coming down from heaven, nothing like that. Now, when you look at this passage and see here where he talks about, you know, the sons of God, how the daughters of men, they were fair, they took the wives of all which they chose. Verse 3, the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he is also flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. That's what this is talking about. There's nothing about them being, you know, angels or, or, or demons. But here, here's the thing, though. Let's just say for a second that these were angels, right? Which we don't believe that, of course. But let's say that these were angels. Then would they be good angels or bad angels? I mean, according to the people who believe this doctrine, these are evil angels that are reserved unto hell and destruction. So that would mean that they would be what we would call demons or devils, right? So here's what this doctrine teaches. Devil equals son of God. Yeah. That's what this doctrine teaches, okay? So let me, just, let me just give you dispensationalism in a nutshell. I'll write it on the board for you. Here's dispensationalism in a nutshell. Devil equals son of God. Okay, I'm teaching you dispensationalism right now. Okay, paradise? Oh, that's hell. Yeah. Yeah. Paradise is hell. And, uh, and the Jews? Yeah, that's God's people. So, there you go, folks. There's a threefold cord of dispensationalism right there. And, and here's the thing. Here's the thing about this teaching. Who do you think would love to say that he's the son of God who's not? Yeah, Satan. Go to Isaiah 14. And I'm going to get to Job 38. I'm just setting this up here. <laughs> I promise I'm going to get to Job 38. But look at Isaiah 14. And by the way, I learned something really interesting about Isaiah 14 today. Because today I was reading a book. And let me tell you something. This is a book that I do highly recommend. If you're interested in the subject at all. I was reading a book called Jesus in the Talmud. Okay? And this book is written by the, the head of Judaic studies at Princeton University. Now, Princeton University is that institution of wild-eyed conspiracy theories, right? Yeah. right? <laughs> look, Princeton University is an Ivy League school that the world would look to as being a place of academia, right? Yeah, yeah. And this guy is the head of Judaic studies there. So this guy is, you know, fluent in the Hebrew and the Aramaic. And he's an expert on Judaism. He's an expert on the Talmud. He's been a professor at this university, Princeton, for decades teaching this stuff. And he wrote a book called Jesus in the Talmud. His name is Dr. Peter Schaefer. And in this book, he just goes through every time the Talmud mentions Jesus. And it is, um, I mean, it is just such blasphemy. I mean, they hate Jesus. And the Talmud is the holy book of Judaism. The Jews' holy book that they base their religion on is called the Talmud. And I mean, it just blasphemes Christ horrifically. But here's what I just learned. The Talmud applies Isaiah 14 to Jesus. Okay? Now, think about that. The Talmud applies Isaiah 14 unto Jesus. You can look it up. You know, you, if you want to do the research, you can read the book, Jesus and the Talmud by Dr. Peter Schaefer. He mentions... They, they mention Jesus as being associated with Isaiah 14. What's another book that, that puts Jesus in Isaiah 14? The NIV. Yeah, the NIV, which is published by, you know, well, we'll not go into that. But anyway, Isaiah 14, look what the Bible says in Isaiah 14, verse 12. It says, how art thou fallen... I need to erase these blasphemies from the whiteboard, but anyway, that's what they teach. So I don't have time to go into all three points tonight. I'm just, yeah, somebody might get the wrong idea if they walk in late or something. <laughs> like, I believe that. But anyway, in Isaiah 14, it says, in verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, 
son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So, Lucifer has fallen from heaven for wanting to be like the Most High, for wanting to be like God, for wanting to put himself in that position that God has. And it says, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Of course, this is what the Talmud wants to pin on Jesus. That this passage is about Jesus. Okay. Really, really, it's... you got to stop interrupting me, okay? I'm, I'm preaching a sermon here. Do you want, would you like to come up and finish the sermon? Brandon, you can come on up here and finish the sermon. Well, All right. Well, why don't you let me finish the sermon then if you're not going to, okay? So Isaiah 14 says that, you know, Lucifer was fallen from heaven because he wanted to be like the Most High. Okay? That's what Satan's downfall was. That's why when he comes to Adam and Eve in the garden, he says to them, you'll be like God if you eat of the fruit. This has always been Satan's deception. He wants to be like God, and then he tells others, you too can become gods. This is the basis of Mormonism. And this is even the basis of humanism and evolution. Like we're evolving and eventually we're going to be like our own gods. But anyway, in Isaiah 14, when we see that Lucifer wants to become like God, wouldn't Lucifer then love to take the place of Jesus? So this doctrine that teaches that, hey, the sons of God are devils. Demons are God's son. The devil is God's son. Satan is a son of God. This is what the Mormons teach. You know, Jesus and Lucifer are brothers. But according to this dispensational garbage taught by Baptists, this would make Lucifer and Jesus brothers. So if somebody gets up and tells you, oh, the sons of God in the Old Testament, that's angels, what they're saying is that Lucifer and Jesus are brothers. Because they're both the sons of God. Now some people will say this, well, they're just called the sons of God because God made them. You know, well, I, you know, I made, let's say I made a, uh, a table. Is that table my son? God made, you know, an ostrich. Is an ostrich a son of God because it was made by God? No. So to say that because God made them, they're his sons? No, that's false. Because the angels, meaning the cherubims, the seraphims, these non-human creatures that God made, they're not made in God's image. You know, God doesn't have four wings and four faces and everything. He looks like a human being because human beings are made in his image. Okay. So basically, uh, we see that this this teaching of the sons of God being angels is a demonic teaching. Because it is that which says the devil is a son of God. He'd love for you to believe that. Now go back to Job 38. I've got to finish up because I'm running out of time. But look at Job 38. And let me finish up with this. Believe it or not, I actually plan on preaching on the whole chapter. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I got a little hung up on this. But anyway, in Job 38, but I, it's fine because I think this is important. I think this is good, uh, good doctrine and good teaching anyway that we need. But look at Job 38. This is their big, this is their big verse that they base everything on. See, I've got scripture after scripture that clearly says that when a person believes on Christ, they become a son of God. When someone calls upon the name of the Lord, they're a son of God. We're the sons of God as believers. Jesus Christ is the son of God. The reason that we're sons of God is because we're in Christ. He's the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus said that he will inherit all things. He said that we as believers, because we're sons, we're joint heirs with Christ. All this clear, crystal clear scripture. And then I have a crystal clear scripture in Hebrews 1, 5, and 6. That just, or Hebrews 1, 5. That just flat out says... He never said to any angel at any time, I'll be to him a father and he'll be my son. Thou art my son this day have I begotten. He never said any of those things. Case closed. I mean, for me, Hebrews 1.5, case closed. Done. But people will say this. They'll say, well, what about Job 38? Now, first of all, they might say, what about Job 1 and 2? Job 1 and 2 is just the sons of God standing before God. Well, what, is it a shock to you that saved people are in heaven? Why would that be a problem for me? There's saved people. I'm going to go to heaven as soon as I die. And I, I know what you're going to bring up, Brandon. You, you want to pipe up again about the fact that people were in the center of the earth. I don't believe in that. I don't believe paradise is hell. Okay? But anyway, the Bible's real clear that saved people have always gone to heaven. From Enoch going and Abel and every, every saved person. 
I don't want to hear it, Brandon. Okay, if you're going to interrupt me again, I'm going to throw you out of the church. You're not going to come in here and interrupt me. Who wants to listen to Brandon preach tonight? Raise your hand. Let's have a church vote. Because if you want to listen to Brandon preach tonight, I'll put Brandon behind the pulpit right now. Is there any takers? Okay, looks like you're outvoted, Brandon. It's time for you to shut your mouth and let me preach the Bible. Okay? And you're welcome to walk out that door right now, or you can stay here and sit down and shut up and listen to me. Amen. Amen. What was I even saying? Somebody help me out. What was I saying? Yeah, I'd like to see you get up here and preach, Brandon, with somebody talking to you the whole time. I can't even keep my train of thought. What was I saying? Job 38. Yeah, that narrows it down. That's the whole sermon. <laughs> yeah, okay, it's Job 38. Let's just, when all else fails, actually go to the chapter I'm supposed to be preaching. But anyway, look at verse uh, 5. It says, Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who has stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Talking about the earth, but watch this. Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars came together and all uh, sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now let me say this. A lot of people will misquote this passage and say that the sons of God shouted for joy when the earth was created. That's what people will say. Hey, Job 38 says that when the earth was created, that's when the sons of God shouted for joy. But in reality, that's not what it says. Because if you look at it carefully, it says in verse 6, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Talking about the earth. But watch the second part of that verse, 6. It says, or who, this is the question, who laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? So, when did the sons of God shout for joy? When the earth was created? No. When the cornerstone was laid. It says, when the cornerstone thereof was laid, that's when the morning stars sang together, and that's when all the sons of God shouted for joy. It does not say at the creation of earth, okay, as people would have you to believe. Now, first of all, you know, I wouldn't even base my primary doctrine on something this huge. I wouldn't contradict Hebrews 1 with a poem from the book of Job, number one. You know, I wouldn't contradict, you know, I wouldn't take something vague and use it to contradict something clear, like Hebrews 1, because let me ask you this. Does verse 7 say the sons of God are angels? Does anybody see that in your Bible? No. Okay, the, does the Bible say in Hebrews 38, 7, the sons of God are angels? No, it doesn't. What it says is that when the cornerstone was laid, the sons of God shouted for joy. So they're using their logic, well, you know, if the, if the sons of God shouted for joy when the cornerstone was laid, that has to be the angels. That's just their logic. Well, that would have to be the angels. Okay, now here's why that doesn't work. Because they're saying, well, it's talking about the creation of the earth. But hold on a minute. Were the angels present at the creation of the earth? No. So that doesn't even hold up. Because in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And in six days, God made the earth and the heavens and all that in them is. So the angels were not existing before Genesis 1-1. Because Genesis 1-1 is the beginning. So God created the earth... Okay, it, not in the presence of angels. There was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and so forth. So that doesn't even solve this problem, number one. Because the angels weren't there when the earth was created either. But number two, this is not talking about the creation of the earth. Because all you have to do is look up the word cornerstone in the Bible. Yes. Every time it occurs, just go home and just look up in your concordance, cornerstone. And every single time, you know who it refers to? Every single time? Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to 1 Peter 2. We'll just look at one of them. Every time. I mean, we're not talking about one scripture or two scriptures. We're talking about a multitude of scriptures that over and over again refer to Jesus Christ as being the cornerstone. And this is something that comes up over and over and over again. It says in verse number 6 of 1 Peter... Again, this is just one for sake of time. It says in 1 Peter 2.6... Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So when was the chief cornerstone laid? When was that cornerstone laid of Jesus Christ? Well, the Bible clearly tells us because it says that the stone which the builders rejected 
The same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Now, here's the thing. Jesus Christ was first rejected of that generation. He was first rejected of the chief priests and, and scribes. After he was rejected, he was laid as the chief cornerstone when he resurrected from the dead. He was the first begotten of the dead. That is when the morning stars sang together and when the sons of God shouted for joy. You say, well, that's too figurative. Well, here's the thing. The earth does not have a literal cornerstone because it's round, number one. So it's not, And here's the thing. Stars, literal stars, don't literally sing either. Again, you're basing it on a poem that is using figurative language that says the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Not literal when you're talking about stars singing. I mean, who's ever looked up at the stars at night? You know, maybe, maybe, maybe when you're dating your wife, you know, and, and the, the, the stars broke into song, you know. It was an amazing thing. That was when I knew we were going to be together forever. No, literal stars don't literally sing. Okay, but when the sons of God shout for joy, and look, I, I can further support this from Scripture. Jesus Christ was told by the Pharisees, Thou art not fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? And he said, you know, before Abraham was, I am. And he said this, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and was glad. So if Abraham rejoiced to see his day and was glad, that day was still coming. Isaiah 53 says he was bruised. For our transgressions. Right? Did that happen yet? No. But it talks about in the past tense. Christ by his stripes were healed. The Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Because God speaks about the things which be not as though they were. Because he knows the end from the beginning. So even before Christ's day came. He said Abraham rejoiced to see my day and was glad. Uh, we see a rejoicing at the cornerstone being laid. We see a rejoicing in the Lord Jesus Christ being foreshadowed in this poem that God is speaking in the book of Job, chapter 38, a foreshadowing of the Lord Jesus Christ because every single time that the word cornerstone is used in the Bible, you just it's consistent. It's talking about Jesus. Not talking about a literal building. The earth is not a literal building. The earth is round. And, and the Bible even teaches in Job that the, that the earth is round. So it's not like they just had their geography or geology wrong. Okay. So anyway, that, you know, anybody who still believes in it after this sermon, I don't know what to tell you. You know, Hebrews 1.5 is the beginning and end of the story. I have even more evidence, uh, but, you know, but I, I don't even have time. But honestly, it's pretty clear that this sci-fi thing of demons coming from heaven and mating with humans and producing, you know, it, it, it makes a great movie. It, I mean, it makes a great story. You know, and it's, you know what it is? It's something for people to sit around the internet and, and, and talk about and go on and on about and not read this book. You did not get it from reading this book. You know, you got it from a UFO website, the Nephilim, and, the, and you know, you go out and you look at all your photoshopped images, and you get all excited with your mouse and your keyboard, and oh, you know, oh man, look at these bones, look at these skulls, look at this, uh, wow, 450 feet tall, that's so cool. <laughs> uh, look, get your science fiction garbage, I'll stick with the King James Bible, this isn't Star Trek, this isn't Star Wars. Okay, human beings can only mate with humans and animals only mate with animals. Yep. And angels neither marry or are given in marriage. Amen. It's that simple. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. And please help us not to be carried about with every wind of doctrine or to believe in doctrines that are so stupid that we would actually say that the devil is a son of God or that paradise means hell. Uh, or that, uh, you know, people who reject Christ are somehow his chosen people, even though they hate Jesus in their holy book, the Talmud. Lord, please just help us to have sound doctrine that comes from your word. And we love you in Jesus' name. We pray, amen. Amen.